Cosa di maniera anche aperta? No, va bene. Aspettiamo di qua, magari. Abbiamo meno rumore. So what we have seen uh, yesterday is that the non-equilibrium condition can play a role in another expansion. And we also uh, highlighted the fact that we can define properly a speed of sound in uh, isentropic condition. That means in frozen flow and in equilibrium flow, this will be a little bit more difficult if we consider non-equilibrium flow. And uh, we have, at the end of class, we, we also said that uh, based on the momentum equation and on the definition of speed of sound, we can still identify the trot of a converging diverging nozzle as the place where the flow changes from subsonic to supersonic. It will be more difficult to evaluate because we, we should compare our Velocity, the local velocity can be computed, for instance, with your tables. Once you know the composition of the mixture that you can evaluate by equilibrium condition, so you take your tables and you see the function, the entropy as a function of temperature, and if you have at a chamber, you have a given value of, let's say, absolute velocity, absolute entropy, sorry, eight zero we can, uh, by given value of temperature and so of composition, probably relatively also to pressure, you have your HC, and you can always evaluate your local velocity in a one-dimensional flow in this way. So it means that you can calculate this velocity, but and you have your temperature. So in principle, from temperature, you can evaluate your speed of sound. And usually, you can compare them and see if you are in subsonic or supersonic condition. So you can evaluate short conditions by changing temperature up to the point where we have that U is equal to H. What we have to do in case, and this works in case of frozen flow for sure, and we will see in one of practices, as we can do this in case of uh, frozen flow. In case of equilibrium flow, still isentropic, still we can check the isentropic, the sonic Mach number condition of trot, but you recall that we need that gamma S. That is something that depends on, not only on the ratio of specific heat, but also on the derivative of the logarithm of, of uh, volume and pressure with respect to pressure and constant temperature. So exactly, let me, yes, uh, it's the, log, the derivative of logarithm of volume with respect to pressure and constant temperature. So this is what we see yesterday. With this definition. So we would need on tables also this quantity to evaluate correctly our speed of sound and check with the flow to be sonic and so to identify the value, the critical value of temperature and the, as a consequence all the other critical values. Excuse me, sir. May I ask a question? Yes. Uh, why does the S stands for under the gamma? Good question. Uh, actually, I don't know. It's uh, something I get from uh, one book. It's just to, to 
K, which is the, the meaning is that it's an equivalent gamma. This it could be uh, this is because it's related to speed of sound. So that we have uh, we can write this gamma allows us to write our uh, a. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, T over O, right? This is the uh, definition of speed of sound and it has this gamma. So it's just to distinguish this from the common gamma that here could be the equilibrium one. This means the ratio between the T and, and CG at equilibrium condition. This could, could mean uh, isentropic. But, so the, the, the subscript test would mean as a result, but actually I don't know. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. So of course, if we don't have such a, a let's say a clear evaluation of condition, of critical condition, of course, also the characteristic velocity could be more difficult to evaluate because of this change of gamma, we have no longer this relation is no longer valid. Because we have changing gamma, we have changing composition. And this is one of the expression that is only valid in case of isentropic ideal flow with constant specific heat. Uh, but we can take this as a reference and consider here the recorded definition the CAT or dot M are all quantities that can be evaluated uh, experimentally, let's say. So we have our reference characteristic velocity that will measure compared to an ideal case, the performance of our combustion process in this case, that means we are considering chemical rocket, so how much energy we do extract from our propellant. So to, to complete the analysis, so once we have, we identify three different regimes, which are the equilibrium one, the non-equilibrium one and the frozen flow one, we can also discuss on where we should apply and how these different assumptions uh, in our expansion process. So this is uh, identified by the ratio of uh, fluid dynamic and chemical uh, characteristic times, as I mentioned, and this is usually reported in terms of the dump trailer number. And this ratio between the char characteristic time of the flow and the, and the characteristic time of the chemistry. And uh, of course, we can identify the different regimes with this number greater than one. That means Cf greater than, much greater than the chemical time. It means that if this time is long, it means that we have uh, also, uh, we have any time for our chemical reaction to occur. And so we have equilibrium flow if this condition is satisfied. On the other hand, we have the If we have the Dunker number is quite less than one, we have, if we have no time for reaction to occur, and so we have what we have called frozen flow.
So let's turn your down color number is order one. That means that the two characteristic times are not far from each other. And uh, in this case, we have what we can call this kind of flow non equilibrium flows, in, meaning that we have an importance of chemical reaction times and evolution. So where we have these different regimes in our nodule. So we have our converging energy state, and here, typically, in this region, we can say that the color number is rather high. And this is true for uh, two reasons. One is that, uh, or let's say for many reasons, one is that the flow is lower here, so we have long characteristic times for the flow. And on the other hand, compared to the full evolution, we can identify here the higher pressure and temperature that make reactions faster. We say that uh, the coefficient that multiplies the different concentration in determining the uh, chemical uh, reaction rate is an increasing function of temperature and uh, also of pressure. We have seen that there are multiplying factors which are proportional to uh, pressure. You recall the density that we have found uh, changing the molar concentrations in uh, mass fractions. And then we have that our K uh, forward and backward are also increasing with temperature. So in this region, we have both the, the, the maximum value of the flow characteristic time and the minimum value of the chemical time. So here uh, is correct, it's reasonable to consider uh, equilibrium condition, at least in our uh, one dimensional overall analysis. Then if we move forward, we have the as the temperature and pressure decreases, the velocity of chemical reaction decrease, and so the characteristic time of chemistry is increasing from one side, and the velocity is increasing. That means that the characteristic characteristic time of the flow, or pressure time of the particles in a region, will be reduced. So we are going, uh, we, are, we are going towards equalizing the two values, the two characteristic time. So there will be a decrease of the Dunkerian number, and during this decrease, we will have a region where this Dunkerian number becomes order one. So here is the equilibrium region. And this is the non-equilibrium region. Or transition, we can also say here. And we say that this is transition because as we move forward, here temperature are decreasing quickly in the expansion, you recall this. And so reaction rates are being reduced and velocity is increasing very fast. So we had that here, we are in the opposite condition and here the color number will be small and as a result, we will have a frozen flow.
this is of course what we have for our chemical rocket in this one dimensional model if you consider also for instance other effect we can imagine that here we have boundary layer along this wall where we are uh, we have the temperature goes from the average value in the core of the flow up to a lower value at the walls. Why I'm saying this? Because we expect that at least for a chemical rocket, we have here very high temperature. We, we are looking for high temperature because it means that we are releasing a lot of heat. It means that we have high characteristic velocities. So we expect here high temperature. High means 3,000, 3,500, this is the order of magnitude that we can have with chemical reactions. So you know that most used material does, do not resist, do not have good properties at this temperature. So if you have wall here, and if you use common metals having good properties uh, from a mechanical point of view, you have materials which withstand temperatures not much more than 1000 Kelvin at the order of magnitude. So for sure what we have is a quite lower temperature at this world. And within the boundary layer, you have that also there is a reduction of velocity up to the wall where velocity is zero. I don't know how much you are familiar with boundary layers, but you know that from the core flow up to the wall, there will be a reduction of velocity from the average core velocity up to the zero velocity at wall. This is an, in a narrow la layer. So in this layer, you reduce velocity, you reduce temperature. So actually what happens is that you are increasing your residence time and you are reducing velocity, uh, you are reducing temperature. That means that you need also more time to, re to reach the equilibrium. So here th there will be a competition of the two changes of uh, the uh, characteristic time. And it may happen that the, the fact that you have more time prevails and so you move towards equilibrium condition. For instance, also here, it could be that within the boundary layer, the flow will reach equilibrium condition. And uh, perhaps this is not the case in other uh, regions because of the lower temperature that tends to freeze the, the chemical reaction. So this can be important, why I'm mentioning this, because you know that uh, the frozen flow freezes some release of energy. That means that some recombination reaction that would release back the energy that has been absorbed by endothermic reaction has not occurred. So if you have close to the world time, enough time for this reaction to occur, you will have locally heat release close to the wall. That means additional heat towards the wall. And here, we, we to keep these walls under the right temperature, it means that typically they are cooled or you have some, uh, some way to protect them. And you should check how much heat is coming from the core flow and the role of chemical reaction within the boundary layer because the change of time scales with respect to the core flow may be important. So, however, for the uh, practical evaluation of basic performance, this is not a convenience model because you have all this region of non-equilibrium that can be, depending on the condition, somewhere uh, 
If this line can be forward, can be backward. And, uh, but we have this undefined region. Now, uh, let me also underline this. Once we consider these times, we are considering also length. I already mentioned this. So it means that this behavior, while uh, we were, when we were talking of the real nozzle, we have no dimension playing a role. You said only shape means affect the solution. We have more precisely only the area ratio. So only the change of area. If you have something like this, or let's say this, and the ratio of the area is the same from here, for instance, to trot. You have the same solution at a given area. Function is only, the solution is only a function of the local ratio of the area to the trot area. So in the one dimensional analysis, we didn't say anything about the X, how the area changes with this dimension, the X dimension, and we didn't say anything about how big the, the nozzle is. If we have a trot area of one millimeter, one centimeter, one meter or more. Okay. Now, once we uh, introduce these characteristic times that depend on the evolution, let's say, of uh, how our thermodynamic variables along the nozzle, that means they are still, in, in our idea, they're still depending on the area ratio locally. What we see is that here, at this temperature, for instance, that we have at chamber, we have uh, the same velocity that you would have in a smaller um, engine, if you consider a big and a small engine, for instance, and you have the same velocity, but a bigger, bigger length. So it means longer times. So a question could be, do you expect uh, a wider extension of the of this first regime of the equilibrium regime for a small engine or for a big engine. So, if you would like to say to say this is the length of the equilibrium region, would it be, would it be bigger in a case with a small trot area, small dimension, or a bigger dimension? this length. Let's say we can also say the length with respect to the nozzle length. This is the same if I consider an engine of scale one or something which is scaled 10 times bigger. Am I alone? From the piccolo, aspetta, che sia questa regione più larga o più, più, più piccola. Sei d'accordo? The bigger the engine, the longer it will be, the, 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 the more likely will be the equilibrium condition because you have at this point, the particle here will stay longer because you have a bigger dimension. So we, if you, in case you have something small, it's clear that you have less time to reach the equilibrium condition. Also by, uh, let's say, common reasoning, you have less time. The particle from here to here with the same velocity still spend more time if the uh, 
rocket is bigger. So there is uh, uh, a simplification that is made for uh, that this three uh, regime analysis, which is based on the fact that here you see this is much greater than one, this is much smaller than one, and you to, we should identify what is the meaning of order one. And uh, what is found is that actually this region is not so large as I uh, show here in this drawing, but it's quite narrow. So you see that uh, the region, the actual region with the current number of order one could be, for instance, here, something like this. So if this is a small region, there will be that the evolution of reaction in this region will have a small effect. And this is true. So we can also attempt to make an analysis of an isentropic flow dividing in two zones, two different regimes, equilibrium and frozen. And we pass from the equilibrium to the frozen one at a fixed point. And this assumption that tell us that our, in general, we have to identify where we have this passage from equilibrium to frozen flow. But in this case, you know that the equilibrium flow is isentropic flow, the frozen flow is isentropic flow, of course, without considering friction and exchange with uh, rounding and this exchange is rounding and uh, this assumption is called the Bray assumption <clears throat> and uh, well the, the problem is here to identify where this line is placed and as I mentioned could be different for engines or different size. However, we can, uh, with this assumption, we can, let's say, calculate with almost nearly analytical, with an analytical relation, the evolution all along the nozzle, and also have a good estimation of performance. Because you recall that we say that if we consider equilibrium ev evolution, we have an overestimation of performance. If we consider the frozen evolution, we have an underestimation of performance. The actual performance would be in between, and these Bray assumptions give us a direction where we can work to get this intermediate uh, solution, which is close to actual performance. And uh, Of course, this is this position can be identified based on the chemical reaction, which is determining the, the chemical characteristic time, which is the slowest one. So if you identify that reaction, you can probably select the uh, sweet position. So I would, I would like also to uh, mention one common approach, which is called the modif modified Bray assumption. And this says that in many cases, it has been found that this line where we have the transition from equilibrium to frozen flow is quite close to short. 
So the modified Bayes assumption assume that we have this uh, transition from equilibrium to frozen flow exactly at trot. And uh, again, this is an isentropic solution that can be uh, obtained, for instance, also in our exercises exploiting tables that the table set I provide. Uh, yes, a comment that uh, uh, I can do is that uh, we have uh, seen and talked about that for chemical rockets. Actually, some of these concepts are useful and should be applied also in general in thermal rockets. And the reason is that in general, even if the heat is not coming from chemical reactions, in thermal rockets, we will like and we do reach high temperatures. And at high temperatures, some chemical reaction occur. For instance, dissociations. And this is because we can identify importance of losses. For instance, in uh, arc jets, you have very high temperatures, you have also ionization somewhere, and so you have reactions which are endothermic and that absorb it. And so you should identify if there is any recombination in the flow evolution, any equilibrium condition somewhere. And uh, for this reason, you also find in the study of in general of thermal rockets, the, the so-called frozen flow losses. Frozen flow losses, that means that we have not recombined everything. We are not in equilibrium condition at the exit. And this means that there have been some chemical reaction before. So if uh, you consider this as a thermal rocket, you have high temperature here, but you have here equilibrium condition. So for instance, you have H2 and you have a dissociation of H2 into H, this one. And because of high temperature, the equilibrium condition will move towards the dissociated condition. Here you have equilibrium, the high temperature, so we will form this atomic hydrogen then, as you accelerate, we go in frozen condition, and the heat which has been absorbed by this dissociation will not be released when temperature decreases because of the high speed, and so the frozen flow occurring in the divergent section. So it means that we have spent, if you are eating from outside, you can see the loss because we are heating. And this part of this heat is spent only to dissociate hydrogen because it's not recovered later in terms of kinetic velocity. Uh, so the, the next step that uh, we, we conclude here, this analysis of different regimes that we have talked about for chemical rockets. And now what we have to, what we have seen so far is that we have uh, let's say our reactants available in a combustion chamber where this reaction occurred in some way and we have these products that will evolve more or less uh, smoothly within our converging diverging nozzle. So we have to, to move back now and to see if I identify propellants, possible reactants, how can I produce these gases? So this next step will be related on how we bring with us our propellants, in which phase, and how we can realize our uh, 
uh, rotor. So we, define, we divide the first <laughs> propellant in, uh, uh, on the basis of uh, their starting phase and in chemical, pro in chemical rockets, we have different classes which are related to uh, the starting phase, that means liquid rockets or liquid propellant rocket engines. Solid phase, so that we have the so called solid rocket motors. And these are the basic ones. And then we have also other options that is partially liquid and partially solid. And we call them hybrid rockets. And we have also propellants that can be stored in gel phase, and they're called isotropic. But I don't mention them. Uh, so in the next, uh, I mean, the next hour, and we'll start to study the, uh, and it will continue for uh, all the next classes up to the end of the course, the main properties, the main characteristics of the most common classes of rockets, which are liquid uh, rocket engines and solid rocket motors. And among liquids, I'm just uh, recalling what we, we, we said at the beginning of the course. Among liquids, we have, we consider monopropellant. Bipropellant. And among uh, solid, we consider homogeneous or double base and heterogeneous. Homogeneous. And heterogeneous. And uh, where the distinction here is that in monopropellant and, and uh, we have, let's say, a single species that will, uh, what has to do? Has to be in uh, some way activated to release heat. So it can be in some way activated for this goal. So there will be some, let's call this decomposition typically that because you start from a single substance, if you have a reaction, it means that you are decomposing this species and uh, this decomposition occurs with the release of it. And uh, bipropellant is what probably among the possible solution is what is closer to the discussion we have so far because we can identify two separate reactants and we bring these reactants together and you make them burn. So uh, I think that probably this is the more clear concept in, based on the above discussion, on the foregoing discussion. In case of uh, solid rockets, we will see it uh, in the next hour, but we can identify, as I said, homogeneous and heterogeneous. That means these are related to the way how the reactants are mixed together. And uh, what I will go in detail in a short uh, while. Uh, then we have this hybrid. Hybrid like in bipropellants, uh, we can consider the, the two reactants, the oxidizer and the fuel, uh, stored uh, in uh, different phases but separate and so we can for instance say that we have a solid fuel and a liquid oxidizer or vice versa a solid oxidizer and a liquid fuel what is more common is the first case when we have solid fuel and liquid oxidizer whereas the the second case 
with uh, soil oxidizer and liquid fuel is less common and it's called also inverse hybrid project. I think it's good to stop uh, now so that I will uh, resume with 10 minutes, uh, one ten, and uh, so that we can start the uh, discussion, the presentation, the lecture on uh, solid rocket models. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>
Riprendiamo. So we start to talk uh, of uh, one of the main family of rockets. So the correct name should be solid propellant rocket motor that we can translate in Italian uh, literally as uh, uh, motori a razzo. A propellant solid, and uh, this is also called, uh, probably more correctly, as endoreattori. Instead of motori a razzo. And uh, also consider that, for short, often it is. When you say solid, we imagine that we consider solid propellant. And so you also find uh, this kind of rockets called that directly solid rocket motor with the acronym SRM. So uh, this means that our propellant are stored in solid phase. We have to produce gas. And so we have to identify, and we'll talk about the way of transforming this solid in gas. The first thing that we have to imagine is that our propellant, uh, let's say we have our reactants, are stored in the same substance, in the same, let's say, the same solid propellant. So the solid propellant includes the substances that will react with each other. And uh, first of all, we have to say why we would be interested in this kind of storage in solid phase. And so also on which are the possible advantages and drawbacks that we have for this kind of rockets that will be, of course, clear after the discussion of some of those properties, and of course, also on the discussion of some of the properties of liquid propellant rocket engines, which are the other family that is the most common one used in, uh, in our uh, space engineering. So uh, the first thing to, so let's say also which are the applications of this. And we, we have considered, we can consider trust level going from very small values. And some of you have seen small solid rockets in the uh, lab course in the, during the laurea and uh, up to mega Newton scale at trust level. So you have a wide range of possible scales of trust and mean size, the core trust is calculated to size of the rocket. Uh, and it's used typically in boosters. This is one of uh, the main application in missiles. And uh, 
less probable is less common for upper stages, but we have also upper stages, as you know, in the Vega rocket, for instance. Is, is not the last stage, but it's the second and third stage. It's not only the first one. And it's also used for when we need to generate a gas. And the reason uh, of, the, uh, of this use of these interests are related to one thing, which is simplicity. In principle, solid rocket motors are very simple. And uh, uh, there are a limited number of components. Typically, uh, it was only also said in general that we have no moving parts. Actually, this is not the case for recent uh, applications because, for instance, we have movable uh, nozzles. So we have some moving parts, but of course, quite less than what we have in their uh, counterparts uh, with liquid storage of propellants. One important aspect, especially for uh, uh, the, the reason why they're interesting for missile application, is that they are ready to use, typically. And so you, you don't need the, once you prepare the rocket, it's available for the use, you don't need to fill, for instance, tanks as this will be done for up to the last moment in a case, for instance, of cryogenic uh, liquid propellant rocket. Then, why we talk of solid uh, rocket model for boosters? Because of the high density of the high density of propellants that make, that give us a good impulse for per unit volume. And this is also uh, one important uh, aspect. Uh, another one is related to scalability. You can change uh, a little of a given framework uh, for a given scheme of a solid rocket models and change the, your design with another one. Is also considered a positive property of solid rocket models. Uh, then there are also drawbacks. And among drawbacks, so if we right here we have high density, ready to use, and uh, simplicity. Simple. These are possible the main advantages. Let's write also scalability. We have among the disadvantages the limited number of available propellants in general, so the difficulties to find uh, a good uh, propellant combination. And uh, especially if you aim to get high enough specific impulses. Because in general, compared to the, uh, let's say, to, to the liquid counterparts, they have not so high IFP. Specific impulses of solid rockets are typically less of what we can get with uh, uh, liquid rocket. And this is an important drawback. Another uh, important drawback is uh, the fact that you have less chances to control trust. And typically, you don't recognize soil rockets. So they are. Uh, not recognizable. And uh, typically, it's not 
the arrows are not sortable. So you cannot control your trust under command. This is the meaning of this. You can, uh, we will see that you can design your own trust profile, but once you have designed your trust profile, you cannot change it in any way. You cannot control. And uh, another disadvantage is that you store propellant that uh, will react in a single, let's say, uh, substance. Or let's, see, let's say substance means, uh, to understand what we're talking about. And so we, uh, of course, we can have some danger. This is something that it should react and should provide a reaction with a lot of energy. So this should be ready to work in this sense and uh, at the same time should be safe enough to be handled during separation. So of course you have to balance these properties and typically it's dangerous material, so for this reason. For instance, if you go uh, somewhere where, where there is some propellant, uh, there will be a lot of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, condition to be respected to enter the room where is propellant in terms of, uh, let's say, if you don't have lighter, you don't have anything that can, uh, or, or you can, you should control that you have not discharge uh, or you have not, uh, electronic devices that can provide it that uh, without your, of course, your will, but uh, it may in some way heat a solid propellant and start it to react and burn. Uh, yes, there is also another drawback. So this is the, the dangerous Let's call it this way, but we said what we meant. And uh, what we say next is that we have to be sure that it works because we cannot try it before uh, using it. So if we have a rocket and uh, in uh, your uh, car engine, you can uh, test your engine before using it. And this is not the case of solid propellant rocket because once you use that propellant, you have to charge them again the propellant and it will never be exactly the same as you've got the first time. And it will not be the same rocket. So this is also another possible that you cannot test before. before use. So at this point, what we have is this material, including our reacting substances, and what we should produce some gas. So what we expect is that we have something like this. It's our propellant. This is a nice uh, color because it's uh, similar to what we find in some rockets. And uh, what we have here, we have our gas. This is our salt propellant. And we should, of course, uh, change this solid in this gas. So we imagine that it is consuming and providing some gas. How we can do it? Uh, this works once, as we have seen in chemical reaction. So this is something that should be able to stay in this solid phase and should be able to be transformed in gas. So how we can separate these two behaviors of the same material? The control comes from temperature. You know that chemical reactions, and we have commented this, 
uh, will be activated when you exceed the given threshold temperature. So if we are below, let's say some ignition temperature, you will, this will be safe, will not react. There will be no gas emission and we can store our propellant. If we ignite it, after this ignition, the, the high temperature gas will be, will provide the heat necessary for the continuation of the reaction. So we have, we need to ignite it. And after ignition, we can keep uh, the reaction occurring because of the heat released by this gas here, which is for giving it in its surrounding. So what you see here, we already see something. If we are eating this propellant, we, we need to have one exposed surface and the remaining part has to be safe for the next use. So what you expect here is that the, the higher the available surface, the higher will be the amount of gas that we can generate after ignition. So this is a first, uh, a first uh, issue that we can uh, identify. And also that, uh, of course, the, the amount of gas that we produce will depend also on this environment, how much gas there is. You, you can imagine that you can eat something with a denser gas at high temperature than at a, a lower density gas. So you can, uh, and what you have to do here, we recall that we said at the beginning that you have to ignite. Of course, you will have fresh solid propellant exposed to the ones you consume, and they have to find always a high temperature to make their decomposition reaction occur, or their, let's say, decombustion reaction occur. Now, where is this reaction? Is it in solid phase, is it in a gaseous phase? It depends on the material we are considering. And uh, actually, the combustion process is rather complicated. Uh, what we have to do, however, is that we have available close to each other the reactants. So when you are uh, realizing your material, your propellant, you have to mix the, the different components that will react together in a proper way to make the, the combustion occur uh, properly. And we understand that the properties at micro scale and at macro scale of these propellants are the characterization of the propellant itself and at the end of the rocket. So this propellant is identified with a name uh, which is commonly said as the propellant grain. And when we identify with this, we have the propellant, which is the combination of substances that are put together to get this propellant grain. And this propellant grain includes, in this description, the, the available, the, the size, the available exposed surface, the shape that we will uh, also see is an important aspect. So one of the things that we will have to uh, analyze is the, for instance, the shape of the propellant grain and of course its properties. Uh, another thing that we can easily identify probably as the most important parameter characterized a given solid propellant 
is the amount of gas that can be released by unit surface. Because, as I said, we, we, we can imagine here that the higher the surface, the higher the amount of gas. But if we look to a given region here, more region, of course, how much will be the gas released here? And if we know how much gas is released by un per unit surface, of course, we can make a discussion on the role of surface on the uh, production of gases. And uh, we will see about the rocket realization and performance. So this is given, this information is given by an important parameter, which is called burning rate. Or combustion rate or regression rate. It's called also regression rate because this can be seen as the velocity. So if we consider this propellant burning on this side, uh, what happens is that after a given time, the exposed solvent will be here because this part will be consumed by the reaction. And so we understand that if the, the propellant will be consumed in the direction normal to its surface and is moving in the direction normal to its surface inside. And so we call this as the regression rate of the propellant. So in fact, if we consider this volume here for a given exposed surface AB and the given, let's say, regression delta X, we can consider that in a given time, delta t such that we have the regress the, the, the propellant of this delta x, we can say that we have consumed an amount of propellant which is related to this delta v, which is a b delta x. And so we can evaluate the amount of volume consumed per unit time and this will be also expressed as the exposed surface by the length of which the propellant has regressed in unit time. So this is the regression rate. This delta x over uh, delta t, or this case, and we have, we use the symbol Rb to refer to this burning rate of our regression rate. So of course, uh, usually, and this means also the amount, the volume of propellant that has been released per unit time, and this available as gas. And what we are interested in in this is on the amount of mass of gas that is produced per unit time, something which is that will be at the end the mass flow rate of our rocket. So the mass per unit time is produced for by the, this combustion process. And this is, of course, we have this volume and the corresponding mass of solid will be the density of propellant by this volume, the change of volume. And so the mass of gas will be, of course, the, the same as the mass of solid consumed. And so we can identify our Burned 
mass flow rate dot mb that will be density of the propellant by the change of volume per unit time. And this is the mass produced per unit time by a given area of propellant. And this should be compared, and we'll do it later, with the mass per unit time which is evolving within our nozzle that making reference to our ideal nozzle, but also in general will be expressing by the, our CSR and chamber pressure and uh, trot area. So we see that these two quantities has to talk with each other. There will be something linking these two quantities. These two dot M that are steady state we expect to be the same or more or less the same. So by this relation, we see the importance of these uh, properties of the solid, which are the propellant density, the burning surface, and the burning rate. So uh, the first uh, quantity that, to, that has to be analyzed for the study of solid propellant is its burning rate. And this burning rate is found experimentally to be a function of the pressure of the environment where we have this burning and of temperature. In considering our propellant, we, we should keep in mind These are the main dependencies. <clears throat> we should keep in mind that uh, the burning should occur independently of the atmosphere in some sense. So it, it will not be a good propellant to one that needs the atmospheric oxygen to burn, of course, because you are not providing this oxygen. The uh, reactants are thus within the propellant itself. So if you like to test, in the atmosphere, you will have something that can be biased by the uh, presence of the atmosphere itself. And uh, so uh, let's see to, to what happens in a closed environment where we can perhaps control this pressure and uh, the atmosphere is not reacting with our uh, propellant, so it's not playing the role. The, just ro the only role that we are interested in of the atmosphere to evaluate this burning rate is that we can control the pressure of the gases. And uh, so this is, as I said, this is an experimental uh, information that affords it's not surprising, we can expect an effect of the initial temperature because it reduced the amount of heat that has to come from the surroundings to bring the propellant up to the ignition temperature. So if this is true, we can expect that the initial temperature, that means we are burning here, and there will be a hot region in the burning region here, Whereas we have, apart from the exposed surface, we have a given temperature value. If we increase this temperature, there will be less need of heating before starting the reaction. So you see that uh, the reaction speed will be higher, and uh, as a consequence, there will be also higher production of gases. That means we have also higher regression rate. So it's instructive to, to talk about the, the basic tool that has been used uh, for the evaluation of this 
burning rate, which is the trend burner. Also called the Crawford Barnett of Crawford Bomb. And we have, uh, let's say, a vessel where we have inside this trend of solid propellant, which can be insulated on this side so that we can check only the velocity in this direction where uh, of the displacement of the exposed surface. So what we do here is to consider some uh, electrical resistance that provide enough heat to ignite our propellant. And then, for instance, probably you can do it with uh, visualization. Uh, today we have uh, accurate ways to do that, but at the beginning, one, one uh, a possible way of evaluating the uh, the the Burning rate was that of considering a couple of wires with a, a, a device measure time here, such that you, you know that the here, when the, this burning surface reached this, this position, it will burn this first wire as they are not connected with each other here. It will burn this first wire and there will be a signal because this wire has been burned and uh, there will be another at another time there will be this burning of the second y so y1 y2 and of course knowing this length you can evaluate you measure the time from the burning of the first y to the burning of the second y and you can have the average uh, burning rate on needed to pass from here to here. And uh, so uh, you this would be considered the same environment a different pressure and exhausting the gas produced by combustion in uh, during operation to keep uh, the, the pressure constant inside the, the vessel you can evaluate the regression rate at different uh, ambient pressure and here typically you can use nitrogen which is uh, more or less inert and so you can uh, be sure that it's not affecting the uh, property of propellant. Because at the end, what we do with this is to estimate a basic propellant property. So you, what you, the, the result of experimental uh, measures is that this burning rate increases with pressure. And uh, typically what is seen is that in a log log scale, of course we are considering giving a given initial temperature. You see for different propellants or ignition temperatures curves that can be like this, where uh, which are characterized by uh, flatter behavior at low pressure and typically 
by straight lines in this log log plane uh, in, let's say, at higher pressure rate, which is the one of interest for us. Because recall that we are interested to have a high chamber pressure because we can expand more, you know, and, uh, and so our focus would be more towards high pressures. So to represent this kind of behavior, a general law is the following. where uh, you see that at the low pressure we have more or less constant value of the burning rate and at high pressure will dominate the second term where we have this dependence with pressure which is of course is the power so it's a straight line in the log plane and uh, uh, this as we are interested more in this part, and we have high pressure, we will use in most of our discussion, this R equal to A, P, C, N. And uh, so this is what is true at high pressure is typically this way. And this law is a basic law for solid proportion that is paid also JDA. or Saint Robert. So that's these two names, the Vier of Saint Robert law. So this uh, give us the dependency of uh, pressure, of uh, burning rate on pressure. and uh, with two quantities, A and N, two, two quantities, A and N. A is the, related to the, in the hour log scale, to the point where we have the intersection with one of the axis. So the position, the eighth of the uh, straight line on the plane and of course, N is related to the slope of this line. And uh, where, well, of course, you see that dependency on pressure is related to this N. And uh, the, for instance, if N is equal to zero, we have uh, uh, no dependence on pressure. If we ha typically we have positive N, that means we have this increase with pressure, in principle, ideal, uh, say theoretically, it could be also a negative N and would be a decreasing behavior with pressure. Uh, this may also occur sometimes for some particular range for particular propellant. But you see that this actually, if we have high values of this N, it means that the uh, burning rate is quite sensitive to pressure. So little changes of pressure will uh, provide high changes of burning rate. And this means also high changes on the mass flow rate produced. So you can expect that high values of N becomes dangerous. Uh, of course, ideally, probably having no dependence would be the best solution. Because what we also have to imagine is that in rockets, you never have, if you look to pressure in time, for any rocket, you will never see something like this, or even if I'm changing thrust, something like this. You never see this you will see something like hmm. 
So to, to say that we never have something which is perfectly smooth at a given pressure. We say a given pressure to say an average pressure, but we, we consider that a uh, few percent oscillation is considered something which is very flat in terms of pressure. And if you are considering something like 100 bar, few percent means one, two, up to 10 hard of oscillation of pressure, which is not nothing. And if you have something which is very sensitive to pressure, it, this may be uh, a danger. So what we see here is I show here some uh, different propellant, let's say propellant one, propellant two, and propellant three. This could be possible behaviors of our measures. So you see straight lines, but in different ranges, they can be, they can have different uh, parameters. Uh, But uh, anyway, what the other, um, yes, one, one thing that I have to mention is that what you expect in terms of RB, in terms of uh, how of nominal values of this burning rate. And typically we can say that this, this is measured in millimeters per second, and we have uh, values in the range of 0.5, to 75 millimeters per second. So this is what you see here in the coordinate. And the other thing to say is that as we, sh we see here that we have this dependence on pressure, we say that we have also dependence on temperature, and we find that this N is not typically dependent on temperature. So the initial temperature will influence our A. So this A is usually called the temperature coefficient. So uh, in the applications, beside this range of RB, we will see that the value of N belongs to the range 0.2 to 0.6. And uh, we will see that the fact that the, this combustion index is less than one is a requirement for a static stability condition that can be easily seen for uh, solid rockets. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, saying more about the sensitivity to the initial temperature, what we can say about this coefficient of temperature A is that we expect that for increasing temperature, our measure will, will uh, give us a higher value of burning rate for increasing uh, initial temperature. So these changes can be also significant. Of course, we, ha we have to keep the temperature below some value. We cannot reach, say, something which is a self-ignition value. There will be a value of temperature such that we start to ignite everywhere the propellant. So 
possibly this should be avoided. And uh, so we can express the uh, dependence of A with T with different expression taking into account this behavior. So in particular, we can say uh, that there is an effect of initial temperature of 20, 30% up to up to 20, 30 percent. And uh, if the irrigation rate, depending on the ambient temperature, if we have a high sensibility, sensitivity, it means that your performance will change depending, for instance, on the day, depending on the ambient temperature. So this has to be kept into account because we can have a direct effect on the overall imports which is provided by or not the overall import, but the, the, the way, the trust profile that we obtain with, uh, uh, depending on the initial temperature. So uh, I'll stop here, and uh, tomorrow we'll see the, uh, some more details about these coefficients, uh, some more dependencies on our burning rate, and also we will see the condition for the stability that we have mentioned before. So the reason why we have that this combustion index and uh, will be in the range between zero and one. So we have the temperature coefficient and the, uh, the N is called combustion index. Scusi, professore. Prego. Cos'è Cos fino al 20-30%? Non ho capito. È l'effetto che può avere la temperatura iniziale sul valore della velocità di combustione. Ok, grazie. Prego. Professore, scusi, una domanda. Non ho, non ho capito benissimo il grafico, quello della pressione in funzione della temperatura con uh, l'andamento oscillante. Non è in funzione della temperatura, ma in funzione del eh tempo. Eh sì, del tempo, scusi, del tempo, ovviamente. Diciamo, questo è un messaggio generale sul comportamento dei razzi, è che quando noi diciamo che abbiamo una pressione di 100 bar, eh, per esempio, o di 50, quello che, che vogliamo, non aspettiamo di trovare nella misurazione della pressione, se mettiamo un sensore e leggiamo la pressione, non aspettiamo di trovare una bella linea liscia senza oscillazioni. Avremo sempre delle oscillazioni e per esempio un'oscillazione dell'1% è considerata un comportamento molto regolare. E quindi diciamo, si tollera un certo range di oscillazioni che non comporta ovviamente conseguenze sulla struttura e eh, sulla, diciamo così, sui problemi termici dei, dei materiali che costituiscono il eh, lendoreattore. Ok, quindi questi due, a parte le oscillazioni, i due andamenti sono due andamenti, diciamo, teorici di due possibili applicazioni, oppure una è preferibile rispetto all'altra? Cioè, forse... Mm. Ho messo due per, perché sono due, diciamo così. Avevo fatto un disegno con un andamento di pressione costante nel tempo. Diciamo questo è tipicamente un endoreattore a propellente liquido, a parte i transitori. Eh, di solito l'endoreattore a propellente solido, come vedremo, abbiamo dei profili di spinta che possono comprendere lunghi periodi di tempo, per cui ho disegnato un profilo di questo genere, ma diciamo, il profilo di eh, pressione, diciamo, questi sono due casi come le linee che stanno su quest'altro grafico, sono diciamo così, indicative di possibili andamenti, quindi se noi abbiamo diciamo, la, la, questa specie di trapezio che ho disegnato è eh, ad indicare che se noi abbiamo un andamento di spinta e quindi di pressione variabile nel tempo, e, che, e ci aspettiamo che sia smooth, anche su quello ci dobbiamo mettere una, dobbiamo sempre pensare che c'è un'oscillazione, tutto qui. 
Ok, va bene, grazie. Arrivederci. Professore, scusi, una domanda. Prego. Ma un eventuale propellente con un indice N che sia pari a zero, eh, non lo abbiamo considerato o non è esistente proprio? Eh, si chiamano plateau eh, propellant sì. e eh, potrebbero essere interessanti, ma diciamo che, che non ce ne sono evidentemente eh, con buone prestazioni perché poi appunto è una, non è un parametro che possiamo facilmente controllare. Il propellente deve bruciare con una certa dipendenza dalla pressione e fornire determinate prestazioni. Bisogna fare i conti con le sostanze che abbiamo a disposizione. Ok, grazie mille. Prego. I will stop here recording and close connections.